but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us much more, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Holy Father, we thank you that while we were ungodly, while we were helpless, while we were sinners, you said even enemies. You reconciled us. You made us your friends. Thank you that if you can save your enemies, you can hold fast your friends. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you said, no longer do I call you simply servants, but you're my friends. And we love you for that incredible status that you've given us, that privilege that we have as the people of God. Thank you for the spirit, our deposit, our earnest, who has been given to us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you assure that the good work that you've begun, you will complete. We know you are the one who opened our eyes up to the need of a Savior. You gave our blind eyes sight. You revealed the truth of the gospel as it was preached. And we ask again for your ministry in our presence, for some who are here who are unsure, some who are watching, some who are in different parts of the world who really don't know that heaven for sure is their home. The very place we are studying, they have no assurance definitively that if this were their last day that they would go there so please speak to them help them to see the wonder and the truth of the cross and all that it means for those who have crossed that line who become members of the kingdom of light help us to grow further thank you for the seed of scripture you call it imperishable seed and that it was the very instrument you used to bring about a second birth and thank you that you call it food, milk, meat, honey, bread, that if we long for it, we can grow in respect to our salvation. So we ask that you would help us to put out of our mind all of the distractions of this life, to give our full focus to worshiping you through your word. Holy Father, help me today. Please fill me, give me the words that you would have me to speak. And I ask it in Jesus' name and for his honor. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, please, this morning and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. If this is your first Sunday here, you'll be interested to know we've been working our way chapter by chapter through the Revelation. And in our last two times together, we just crack the door into this chapter. We studied just the first eight verses. And if you were not here, you might want to go and listen to those if you are new to this church we have an app search the scriptures all of the messages are there at search the scriptures and you can download the last two messages because they're really foundational i mean we often sing as christians when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be but what is heaven really going to be like well this morning i'm going to tell you what i believe about heaven but my ideas do not originate with me they come right here from the word of god and so we are here in the Revelation. The book opens the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Most of you know by now the word Revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis. It means to, un, to reveal. In other words, the purpose of this book is not to leave you in a sense of mystery, in a sense of darkness. God gave the Revelation not to conceal but to reveal and so in some of your English Bibles, this book is entitled The Apocalypse. The titles in our books are much like the chapter and verse divisions. They're not inspired. They're there just to help us to find our way around. The Apocalypsis, or the Apocalypse, is a good title for the Revelation. And by the way, you know by now it's not called The Revelations. We're not studying the book of Revelations. There's no such book. It's called The Revelation. It's a single revelation given from the Lord Jesus to the Apostle John. And so it's about him. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you read the revelation and all you can see are beasts and plagues and supernatural disasters, then read it again. Because it's really, truly about him. And today we're studying 
the holy city, also called in verse 2 of this chapter, the New Jerusalem. If you remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, before that happened, he met the disciples in the upper room, and he spoke of his departure. And he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go and I prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And so when your loved ones die, if they know Jesus is their personal Lord and Savior, they go to this place that we are studying. Now this is part two of a three-part series on what is heaven like when heaven literally comes to earth, when God's new Jerusalem comes to the earth. And so John is describing in this chapter a brand new world that God will create. The chapter opens speaking of a new heaven and a new earth. And what I'm going to cover today is important. We're only going to look at verses 9 through 14 because I want to run down a few rabbit trails that are very, very important where really the book of Revelation itself is being undermined today through what's known as replacement theology. Sometimes it's given a fancy name, supersessionism. That is that the church has superseded the people of Israel. But that is wrong, and our passage this morning will remind us of just how wrong it is. That concept that the church has replaced Israel because of their unbelief began to become popularized through a man by the name of Augustine. You'll meet Augustine in heaven, but Augustine said some terrible things in the city of God about the Jewish people. And if you've been to Yad Vashem, the very first exhibit that you see when you walk through there is of Augustine and some of the horrible, heinous things he said about the Jewish people. The Roman Catholic Church picked up on the teachings of Augustine, that is, that the Jewish people had been replaced by the church. They just put a different spin on it. They said, by their church, by the Roman Catholic Church. And so to this day, they argue that they are the one true church. The Protestant reformers who came out of Catholicism, remember, there were always God's men and women who were not a part of the Roman Church. They weren't trying to reform anything because they were never a part of it. Unfortunately, many of those men and women get very little press. You hear of people like Calvin and Lutheran and Swingley and Melanchthon and others who come out of Catholicism. But they put a different spin on it, and they said, well, yes, the church has replaced Israel, but not the Roman Catholic Church, those who are born-again Christians. Well, our passage this morning discounts the gross error that is taught in that position. And I say this not to be hateful or divisive, but I say this because this is what the Word of God clearly teaches, and we need to pay close attention. I want to begin reading in verse 9 where we left off last time, so follow along in your Bibles. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written on them which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So again, there on your note-taking outline, there's one in your bulletin if you're new. The title of the message is When Heaven Comes to Earth, subtitled God's New Jerusalem. This is a picture of God's shining city. So far, we have studied that the New Jerusalem, what we often call today heaven, is a permanent place. It is a forever place where God's people will live, but the place where they are at today, as we will see again, is just the capital city of a new heaven and a new earth. It's a prepared place. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. None of the Old Testament saints lived there. 
When they died, they immediately went to Abraham's bosom, also called paradise, also called Hades. And there were two compartments to Hades, righteous Hades and unrighteous Hades. But at the ascension, all of the Old Testament saints were carried to the New Jerusalem, also called paradise today. So don't be confused with those terms. Since the day of Pentecost, immediately absent from the body, present with the Lord, you go home to the New Jerusalem. And it's the place that God has prepared. We saw it's not a frightening place, it's a pleasing place. It's a welcoming place. We also studied that it's a purified place. Not anyone can go. And now we're going to see it is a phenomenal place. It's absolutely breathtaking. Let's read again verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So if you go today, say to buy a house, you're typically able to learn a lot about that house ever before you arrive on the property to physically look at it. Apart from being able online today to see the inside of a house, you can often look at the exterior. Used to be some years back, you would go to Google Earth and maybe you're moving from another state and you wanted to kind of focus from above. Now, a lot of real estate agents, they use drones and uh, they give you a view of the property and the neighborhood and what it's like so you get an aerial view. Well, God is giving his man, the Apostle John, an aerial view of the New Jerusalem. He brings him to a high mountain. He's on the New Earth and he watches the New Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down. Now, notice this particular angel in this verse. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues. So we learn that this is one of the seven angels. Remember, there are 21 judgments we've studied here in the Revelation. Seven seal judgments in the seventh seal with seven trumpet judgments in the seventh trumpet were seven bowl judgments. And so we were introduced to the bowl judgments back in chapter 15, where we were told there was one angel for each bowl. Turn back a page in your Bible, would you, to chapter 17 and verse 1. And again, this is the same angel that is introducing John to this aerial view of the city. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, if you remember, chapters 17 and 18 deal with a future city known as Babylon. And Babylon will have a religious along with an economic dimension to it. So 17 deals with the religious side of future Babylon. And chapter 18 deals with the economic side, and it will be the capital where the Antichrist will rule the earth from. It's not in Jerusalem. I suggested to you that it was the city of Rome. In either case, the angel gives John a view of what that city was like. And if you're a born-again Christian, the things that he shows him are just repulsive to our nature, because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. And that city is called the Great Harlot, by contrast, this angel now shows John the holy city. And this city is described not like a harlot. It's described as a wife, the wife of the Messiah. And the closeness of the words in chapter 17 and verse 1 and chapter 21 and verse 1 makes it unmistakable that he's talking about two different places and two different groups of people. Again, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the bride, the wife. Now, what exactly is John being shown here? Is this angel showing the apostle John the bride? Or as verse 10 indicates, is he being shown the holy city? Or the new Jerusalem? And the answer is yes, both. Because the new Jerusalem is also called the bride. That could be in your list of names for heaven. And it's also called the holy city. And it's quite an appropriate name. Look, if you will, back in verse 2 of this chapter. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Since this is the place where God's bride Israel will be, 
In the Old Testament, Israel is called the bride of Yahweh. And since this is the place where God's bride, the church, will be, we are called the bride of Christ. It's fitting to refer to this city as the bride city. And so as this beautifully adorned, magnificent city descends out of heaven, in essence, God says, here comes the bride. It's, gr- it's a great title to describe where God's people. It's the eternal city, and this city is also called the bride. Now, today, if a church burns down, the pastor will often say, well, we lost our church building, but we didn't lose our people. And when they say something like that, that's a good, sound theological statement because this church building is not the church. This is the meeting place of Community Bible Church. The church is never used in Scripture of a building, of course, only of people. And so since this city is associated with the bride of Christ, with the bride of Yahweh, it's called the bride, and it's a beautiful designation. Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So today we're going to get, and in the next week, just a little bit of an exterior view, and then we'll move to the inside of this city called the New Jerusalem. And when you study this city, it's really breathtaking. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it's in direct contrast to Babylon that is described as the pornace, the harlot. We get our word pornography from it. The people of this world follow after sensual things, whether it's smoking dope or getting high on beer or taking a pill or living sexually immoral. They're driven by the sensual. But the people of God are driven by an entirely different set of values. And again, as I mentioned last time, this is just the capital city. God spends a lot of time on the capital city because for 2,000 years, when someone dies as a believer, they go to this capital city. It's called the New Jerusalem. It's called the Father's House. It's called Paradise. It's called the Holy City. It's called the Kingdom of God, and so on. Look at verse 10. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. So he's on the earth. And he showed me the Holy City, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. Now, what earth is he on? Well, let's put it in the context. Remember what's happened. In the 19th chapter, Jesus comes back. In the 4th chapter, he comes back for the church. We call that the rapture. A door in heaven is opened. And so from chapter 4 all the way through the end of 18, the church is never mentioned again. Why? Because the church is in heaven. And we saw the church there represented by the 24 elders. But at the end of the seven-plus-year period called the Great Tribulation, Christ will come back to the earth. We call that the second coming. So in chapter 19, the second coming has taken place. Satan has been put away into the abyss for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, after Jesus rules and reigns on the earth, uh, Satan will be loosed. He will tempt some of the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of tribulation saints who are able to procreate during the time of the millennial reign of the Messiah and he will tempt some of them to go against God's Christ, then he and all the unbelievers will be cast into the lake of fire. So what will happen? Look at chapter 20 and verse 11. All the lost of all time at the end of the thousand years are arraigned. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Where did earth and heaven go? They they dissolved. This planet that you are on, as we'll review again in a moment, will be gone someday. So heaven and earth will flee away, and somewhere in out of space, wherever it is, God will gather the lost of all time. And we saw in Revelation 20, 11 to 15, that every single person at that judgment will be cast into the lake of fire. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. The chapter opens, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So before the new heaven and the new earth can appear, the old heaven and the old earth must disappear. This earth that we are on this morning is the stage for rebellion and for sin. And so out of absolute necessity, because of the holiness of God, and because all sin will be eternally removed from his kingdom, 
he is going to create a brand new heaven. Even the heaven that is above us is polluted. Not just with pollutants, but above the first heaven, the air we breathe, there's the second heaven where the stars above are, and then there's what the Bible calls the third heaven, again, one of the names for heaven. Paul was caught up into the third heaven. He calls it paradisus, paradise. We call it the Father's home. We call it the place where our loved ones go when they die. So even the second heaven has been polluted. Why? Because there's spiritual warfare that is going on in the heavenly places. Read Daniel chapter 10. You'll get a beautiful picture of that. So God is going to rid all of that. Brand new earth, brand new atmosphere, brand new second heaven, and the third heaven will literally come down upon the earth. Now, occasionally, you will hear a pastor today, largely covenant theologians. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, but people who say, well, God's just going to fix up this earth. And they have to do that because they think that there's no future for Israel. They think that God somehow is just going to fix up the current earth. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Listen to what Isaiah 65 records. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. That's what we just read in John's revelation. Now, he has already described prior to this the millennial earth. But then he speaks of a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. And by the way, interestingly, the word created that the Spirit of God gives Isaiah to use in this verse is the same word that's used in Genesis 1-1, bara. Barashit bara, in the beginning created Elohim God, the heavens and the earth. It's a specific word. There's another word for creating something in the Bible where you take two or three objects and you make something. But when God uses the word bara, he is describing something that is made from nothing. God creates ex nihilo. You've heard that term that theologues use, out of nothing. He creates a new heaven and a new earth. So he's reminding us this is something very different. Listen to what the psalmist said. Of old you founded the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Yet, he notes, even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them. They will serve their purpose. They will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth will pass away. It's going to pass away. But, he says, my words will not pass away. Listen to what Peter wrote, that we are to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. We are talking about a meltdown, not some remake. And then he says, but according to the promise, we are looking for new heavens. Why? Because number one and number two are gone and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And Peter uses the same word new He could have used another, but he uses the same word new that John uses here in Revelation 21.1 when he said, I saw a new heaven and a kynos, a new earth. And it speaks of something that is fresh in character, that's new in kind and new in time. It will be very different, and it will be primarily different in that it will be a place in which righteousness dwells. This creation is fallen You've been to some beautiful parts of the world, I'm sure. But none of those places that you've seen even begin to compare because even the most magnificent scene that you can fix in your mind, it's still an expression of a world that is fallen. So I saw the holy city, verse 2, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So it's seen from John literally as coming down out of heaven. So he's, again, perspective. He's on the new planet. God has already made it. The angel brings him to a high mountain. And now it's time for the new Jerusalem to literally, physically, actually descend from heaven and to land on the earth. Look again at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Now, it's still called earth, 
because in some ways it corresponds to the planet that we are in. But it is a brand new earth. And this place called the New Jerusalem will literally descend on the planet. Now, most Christians today have never really thought about this. I think, well, we just die and go to heaven, and that's it. And they've never really thought about it, for the most part, because the book of Revelation is one of the most ignored books in all of the New Testament. But we need to study it, because it speaks much about the future, and we are to set our minds on the things above and not simply the things that are on earth. The holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. God is preparing this place, and it's what we might call downtown heaven. This is just a fraction of all that God has for us in the future. And as he watches it descend, we learn that it is characterized, notice verse 11, as having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. So here he is on top of this high mountain, and as he watches the holy city come down, he's just overwhelmed by its glory, by its glow, by its brilliance. We've studied already the phrase, the glory of God in the Revelation. And one of the def definitions of the glory of God in the Bible is what we call the Shekinah. You've heard that term, right? The Shekinah glory. It's a word that's not really found in the Bible. It's a descriptive word of what's taught in the Bible. It's much like the word Trinity. The word Trinity is found nowhere in Holy Scripture, but it summarizes a biblical truth. Even so, the word Shekinah is a Hebrew word that speaks of the splendor or the brightness of God's presence. So let's think about this for a moment. The Shekinah glory of God first appears, if you remember, when the Jewish people were delivered from Egypt into the promised land. And so during the day, there would be a pillar of cloud that would lead them. And when the sun set, so to speak, during the night, there would be a pillar of fire to enlighten them. That's the first time we see the Shekinah, the brightness of God's glory, ever appear upon the earth. The second time the Shekinah appears is in Exodus 19 and verse 18, when Moses goes to the top of the mountain and he receives the Ten Commandments. Let me read that verse. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. The third time is when, after he comes down, he goes back up, and this time he gets a set of blueprints for the tabernacle. Now, in some of the movies on Moses, you see Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments under his arm, but actually he also had the blueprints for the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a very important place in Scripture. It was the portable worship center that later, of course, becomes in a more permanent structure, the temple. But when he goes up to get the plans, we read in Exodus 24, 16, the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. You can read about it. Likewise, Exodus 33, verse 9, you see the Shekinah appear a fourth time at the tent of meeting. Remember, Moses had this little tent, and he set it up outside the camp. And all the people, the Bible would say, would go to the entrance of their tent, and they'd watch. And they'd see God's magnificent glory ascend over Moses' little tent. Remember, uh, when he came out, he had to put a veil over his face because his face was so bright and it just glowed. It was called the Tent of Meeting. Now, don't confuse that. The tabernacle later is also called the Tent of Meeting, but this was Moses' tent. And we read in Exodus 33 in verse 9 how the Shekinah ascended on that. Fifth, we know from Leviticus chapter 16 that the Shekinah glory also rested, uh, it filled the, Exodus 40, verse 34, that it filled the tabernacle. So the first uh, worship center they built was the tabernacle. Some of you went, to me, went with me to Israel one time. We saw some Messianic Jews, some Jewish Christians who had reconstructed the tabernacle. It was perfect. I mean, some of the Orthodox rabbis came down from Jerusalem to make sure that it was not heretical and they had their measuring rods and everything else and it was like perfect. And it needed to be because the tabernacle is a picture 
of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into that tabernacle, we are told in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 2, the Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And so once a year, the high priest could go into that section of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. Then, if you remember, Solomon built the first temple a more permanent structure. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, the day the, taber- the temple is dedicated, the glory of God appears. It happened that when the priests came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord, that's what we're reading about in Revelation, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Here's a picture of the western wall. This is where Jews go today to worship. Why do they worship at this wall? This, by the way, is just the retaining wall for the Temple Mount. When Jesus said not one stone would be upon, left upon another, he's talking about the structure that was up on top of that mount, on top of that platform. But this is the Western Wall. And for some 500 years, Jews have gone here. There were some times when it was blocked out, and there were times when they had to go to the Eastern Wall to worship. But this is the closest place a Jew could get to where the temple was located right above. Most Jews think it's right where the Dome of the Rock is. Some put it north of the Dome of the Rock. Some put it south. But it is as close as they can get. And what's important to them is not the wall. The wall means nothing to them. It's what's on the other side of that wall. Because that's where the glory of God literally actually appeared. Um, The prophet Ezekiel later saw the Shekinah glory of God leave. Let me read to you from Ezekiel chapter 10. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple. And the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And then we read in the next chapter, chapter 11, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. So here's Ezekiel, and he sees the glory of God depart, and it makes its last stop there on the top of the Mount of Olives. Then, of course, the second temple is built. The first temple was destroyed and obliterated by the Babylonians. Then, if you remember, they come back. Nehemiah builds the walls so that they can build the temple. They build the second temple. That's the one that Herod later gives a facelift two centuries later. But when they dedicate that temple, the glory of God never came back. And they never again saw the Shekinah glory of God. For 400 years, the temple was empty. They longed, they prayed, they they asked God's presence to come back. And then the next time you see the glory of God, the eighth time, the Shekinah, is in a little field outside of Bethlehem where some shepherds are raising Passover sheep. That's where they were raised. And the Bible says, And the glory of the Lord shone around them. John will also, in reference to the birth of Christ, describe the docks of the glory of the Father being tabernacled in the Son. And so even in Jesus... Though his flesh veils the glory of God, the glory of God was present. And if you remember, for a brief moment, there on the Mount of Transfiguration, they see a glimpse of the glory of Christ. Later on, after the ascension in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, he preaches a powerful sermon. He reviews the whole Old Testament. You want to know what the Old Testament is about? Read Acts 7. If you can understand the events of Acts 7, I have the whole book of Acts, verse by verse, exposited, you'll get a handle on the entire Old Testament. And he goes through the whole Old Testament without notes, without any written scripture. He just just speaks it. What a man of God. And they are convicted to the core. And they grit their teeth. And they pick up stones. And the first martyr of the church falls And he looks up and he sees the Shekinah, the glory of God as Jesus is standing in heaven and as he is welcomed. 
The next time is in Acts chapter 9. Paul had been persecuting the church. He's on his way to Damascus, and then suddenly as he's traveling down the Damascus road, the glorious light of the resurrection, the Shekinah brightness of God appears again and blinds him. The next time was in Revelation 1:17 where we saw the Apostle John get a glimpse of Christ's heavenly glory, and if you remember, he fell down at his feet like a dead man. So here in this vision, John sees a full and open disclosure of the glory of God. Today we get a glimpse of God's glory, I suppose, even in dwelling a believer when you see at moments that Christ-like behavior, but it ain't nothing to what we're going to see someday. And it is so bright and it is so glorious, it will light all of heaven, the very glory of God. Having the glory of God, verse 11, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. You know, I don't know how to describe this except to say that this is a phenomenal place, and I suppose those words are not even adequate. It's just breathtaking. It blows him away. You know, a bride prepares herself. She goes through all the preparations, her hair, her makeup, her dress, everything, so that when she comes down the aisle, she is as presentable as she can be to her groom. Well, God is preparing a place just like that, and it will be so breathtaking, so awesome, you will hardly be able to speak. In addition to being a phenomenal place, beginning in verse 12, I want you to see that heaven is a private place. In verses 12 through 14, we're given some of the major specifications of this city. And it's described in a way in that we can relate, and rightly so, because it's a real place. There's foundations, there's walls, there's gates, there's shape, there's size to it. Look at verse 12. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. So it has a great and high wall. For what purpose? As a means of defense? Obviously not. There's no sin. All the sin is now forever gone, forever, out of the whole universe. But this is a beautiful city, just like God's earth, are an expression of his creative hand. So is this place. You're made in the image of God. This is not some nirvana like our Hindu friends think. This is a real place with real walls. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, 12 angels. Now, the number 12 is pretty prominent in the Revelation, and especially in this section of Scripture. You might want to circle the word, the number 12. Uh, Notice there are 12 tribes of Israel. I have that circled. There are 12 foundations. There are 12 apostles. There are 12 pearls, and we've already studied back in, or we will study in chapter uh, 22 and verse 20, 22, verse 2, of 12 kinds of fruit. So 12 is an important number. And Peter, notice, is not standing at one of these gates. <laughs> Peter has been forever standing at the gates and a lot of jokes. That's bad theology. Peter is not standing at any gate. He is an inhabitant of this place. But there are 12 angels there to welcome you. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates. Not the gates, 12 angels. And notice, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So each of the 12 gates is named. And they're named with one of the sons of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, which reminds us that even in eternity, Israel will have a distinctive role in God's plan. God has never forgotten the 12 tribes. When God made a covenant with Abraham, he said, I will make an everlasting, you know what everlasting means? It means it lasts forever. An everlasting covenant. I've loved you with an everlasting love. And put out in the margin, would you... um, Ezekiel 48, 31 to 34. Put that out in the margin next to verses 12 and 13. You can go home and study the whole chapter later, but let me just read at least one of those verses. Ezekiel 48. He's talking about a different temple. He's talking about the millennial temple, but this is important. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, 
and three gates on the west. So the millennial temple is structured very similarly to the new Jerusalem. And when you go and you read that chapter of Scripture, you're going to discover that there in the millennial temple, there are also 12 names that are written on the 12 gates. And one of those names will be Dan. Remember Dan? We studied him back in Revelation 7 by the fact that he wasn't listed. And the 12 tribes where God raises up 144,000 Jewish people. Dan, that tribe, because of their idolatry, was not given the privilege to share the gospel during the seven-year tribulation period. But they will be reinstated during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Read Ezekiel 48. Remember, there's different temples. Keep them straight in your mind. First, there's the tabernacle. That's the portable tent. Then there's the Solomonic temple. Then that's destroyed when the Babylonians come. And Zerubbabel builds a second temple. Zerubbabel uh, starts it, does a good job, uh, but it's Herod the Great who makes it magnificent. He makes it breathtaking. And uh, he did some things to the Temple Mount that we still see there today, his work, his handiwork. That was destroyed in 70 AD. There's going to be a fourth temple that we've studied, if you include the tabernacle, which is also called the temple, in one case, when it's in Shiloh for 350 years. There's another temple, the third physical temple, the fourth in terms of terminology. It's the place where the Antichrist will go and defile. But then there's going to be a fifth temple, so to speak, or you could call it number four in terms of permanent structure, in that it will be the millennial temple. So for a thousand years, there'll be a temple in Jerusalem where people who are born during that time, because remember, folks will enter into the millennial reign of Christ who survived the tribulation in their natural bodies. will have children, great-grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And it will be a teaching tool, not just for them, but for us. If you've ever studied the tabernacle or the temple, it's like mind-blowing. It's like every single dimension of the tabernacle later in the temple spoke about who Jesus is and what he would accomplish for us. And God will use that as a teaching tool, as an evangelistic tool, much like I suppose the Lord's table is used today, not only to remind us, but sometimes to speak to the hearts of unbelievers who come and watch us. Look at verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 tribes of the 12 apostles. So not only do you have the 12 gates with the 12 names of the tribes of Israel, but now we have the 12 foundation stones that have the name of the 12 apostles. By the way, what a mix. And what a final blow to replacement theology. Now, replacement theology, I know that's a term that's kind of new to some of you. But it's an important term. Again, it summarizes born-again Christians today and non-born-again Christians, those who are nominal Christians, who say that God's done with the people of Israel. And it's very sad what they teach because they are lulling the church to sleep about what God said would happen at the end of time. You see, in the Old Testament, let me read to you from the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. Some of you uh, don't spend too much time in Leviticus, I know. But Leviticus 3.16 is as inspired as John 3.16. It's all God's word. Moses said, God speaking through him, I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it will be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations and draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. What's he talking about? Now again, those who teach replacement theology say, well, he's talking about the Babylonian exile and the Assyrian exile and when the Assyrians came down and crushed the Jews and when the Babylonians did later on. No, that's not what he's talking about. In 722 B.C., the Assyrians came, carried away the ten northern tribes. They carry them to a certain geographical location. They are overthrown by another people called the Babylonians. And in 586 B.C., they come down and carry away the two southern tribes to the same geographical location. Moses is talking about the Jews being scattered to the nations of the world. When did that happen? 
Jesus spoke of when it would happen. If you remember on Wednesday before the crucifixion, he was on the Mount of Olives and the disciples are commenting on the temple buildings and they ask him about the temple and they ask him about his return from heaven. And he says this concerning the destruction of the temple. And they will fall, the Jewish people, by the edge of the sword and will be led captive, where? Into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In 70 AD, a general by the name of Titus Vespucian came in and he did exactly what Jesus prophesied. And he destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left upon another. He decimated the city. The Jews were scattered. Some were kept. By 135 AD, they're all gone. They're scattered to the nations of the world with a few handfuls left. But for the most part, they're gone. Scattered to the nations. That's what Moses said 1,400 years before Christ. That's what Jesus said on the Temple Mount. Now, stay with me. This is not boring if you can see what God wants you to see today. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, 2,500 years ago, Moses wrote this. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it, but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you where? Among the peoples, among the goyim, among the nations. And you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. But then Moses immediately promises in the same chapter, when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days, if you know your Bible, you know the phrase, the latter days refer to the final time frame in human history where the Messiah comes a second time, what we call the second coming of Jesus, when he sets up his kingdom. Moses says here, in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. Then in Deuteronomy 28, he warns, It shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth, we're not talking about Babylon or Assyria, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. But again, 1,400 years before Christ, 2,500 years ago, thereabouts. Chapter 30, God promises, if your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possess, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Listen to what the prophet Ezekiel said. He lives 800 years before Jesus. For I will take you from the nations. That's where they've been scattered. Remember, God said, I'll scatter you. I'll make the land desolate. When I was in Israel in September, one of the people in the church said, Pastor Carl, I don't mean to be rude, but this sure doesn't look like the land of flowing with milk and honey. It looks pretty desolate. That's what God said would happen. It was left desolate. And through just ignoring the cultivation of the land. Some parts of Israel turned into a swamp, and so the whole northern Galilean region, and this brother in the back who was raised there, Dan can tell you, or in other parts, it just became like a, a rock desert. God brought a judgment on the land. So when you see Moses and sending the spies in and they come in with all this magnificent fruit that's a picture of the land, it's like, what happened? God judged the land. But God said in the end of time, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Now listen, Ezekiel 38, next chapter. After many days you will be summoned, when in the latter years you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations. I don't know if you know this, but this is a remarkable moment that we are living at in human history. There's never been a nation in all of recorded history, and there's only 6,000 years of recorded history, where nations ceased to exist, and then they became a nation again. 
But God said of his Jewish people, because of your disobedience, because of your unbelief, and the final nail in the coffin was when they as a nation formally rejected Jesus as the Savior. He spread them to the nations of the world. It was the judgment of God. But God said at the end of time, and you read what Moses writes, you read what Ezekiel writes, and he's describing that time frame when the Messiah, it has to refer to his second coming, will rule and reign on the earth. It's never happened. Jesus never had the governments of this world on his shoulders, but he will at his second coming. He will gather the people from across the planet, and he will bring them back into the land. And so the Zionist movement began in primarily in the 1890s. There were 25,000 Jewish people in Israel the first time we have demographics in 1890. When they become a nation on May the 14th, 1948, and the prophet Isaiah said they'll become a nation in one day, they had 600,000 Jews living in Israel. When I started the Revelation series two plus years ago, they had 6.2 million Jews living there. This morning they have 6.8 million Jews and most would acknowledge there's only about 12 and a half million Jews in the whole planet. A little sliver of land about the size of Delaware, a sliver of people compared to the 7.6 billion people across the planet and they are the focus of the news virtually every single day. Why? Because God is fulfilling prophecy he is keeping his promise because he cannot lie. We are seeing something happening that God would say, said would happen at the very end of time. And if these prophecies are coming true in our life, how soon might it be before we stand face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, unlike Harold Camping and others like him, I do not know when Jesus will precisely return because no one knows the day or the hour. But when we see prophecy relating to the second coming being fulfilled in our day, we know the rapture that is seven plus years before that is all that much closer. Listen, replacement theology cannot give God glory for what he did when in one day he made Israel a nation. You go to Israel today, there are all kinds of languages in addition to Hebrew that are spoken. There are Jews that are speaking over a hundred languages in that piece of land because God is bringing the Jewish people from across the planet back into the land of Israel. And replacement of theology cannot give God the praise for what he's done. When you ask them, well, who's responsible for what's happening? They would say, well, not God. And they were repudiating one of the greatest proofs that God recorded in Holy Scripture that he is very much involved in that nation. This should be a wake-up call to the church because remember at the end of time, the church will be lethargic. It will be lukewarm, the Bible teaches. And you don't want to become a part of that lukewarm generation. Replacement theology is very dangerous because, among other things, it feeds the spirit of anti-Semitism. Not by choice. I'm not saying that my Reformed brothers who teach replacement theology are anti-Semites because they're not. The love of Christ has been poured out in their heart. And they love people, but they see nothing unique for Israel. And because of a lack of teaching about God's future for Israel, they've created a vacuum for the anti-Semite to walk in. This is true in all realms of theology. For instance, if a pastor only preaches on the love of God and he fails to preach on the wrath of God and a place called hell then he has created a distorted view of God. Or if a pastor, say, refuses to teach on the gender distinctions of our day since the creation of Adam and Eve. I made them male and female. And it just seems like every week something new is coming down the pike. And so one of the major cereal companies just made for us transgender LBGTQ cereal. Wonderful. I won't buy from them anymore if I don't have to. Last week, the Coca-Cola company created a commercial where they showed three mothers helping their children to transgender themselves. Sick. But you see, if you refuse to teach what God says, 
then you create a vacuum. And perversion enters into the land. And God gave a great warning when he made this covenant with Abraham, when he established this nation. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will bless the one who curses you. And the one who curses you, excuse me, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Every Christian today is blessed because of the Jewish people. We have a Jewish book. Every author of your Bible is Jewish. And your Savior is Jewish. We are blessed because of the Jewish people. And by default, when replacement theology does not teach what God says about the Jewish people, it opens the door for the anti-Semite to walk right through. And I want to tell you, people who are anti-Semites are people who do not know the living God. God will do what he said. I will curse those who curse you. The very first anti-Semite we find in Scripture was the Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And so under a means of population control, he killed all the little Jewish baby boys. And then God brought the destroyer through the land, and he killed the firstborn in every house there in Israel. And he ended up drowning Pharaoh and his entire army. And they came under the Abrahamic curse as they became fish food there in the Red Sea. I will curse those who curse you. Where are all the Canaanite people who persecuted the Jews? They're gone. Not a single one of their nations exists today. Where is Haman and his sons who sought to destroy the Jewish people? They were all hung on the gallows. Why? Because they will curse those who curse you. Where is the Persian Empire? Where is the Babylonian Empire? Where is the Ottoman Empire? Where is Adolf Hitler? Where is his Nazi Empire? They are all gone. Why? Because I will curse those who curse you. But where is Israel? They are on a tiny slice of land, and they were powerful, they prosper, and they were very much alive. And we need to shout that in defiance of replacement theology that Israel lives. We need to shout it to all the anti-Semites living in Jerusalem this morning that Israel lives. We need to shout it from the housetops to those in the United Nations who year after year, month after month, write laws, so to speak, against Israel that Israel lives. We need to shout it to the Iranian government who says they want to drive the little Satan into the sea and to destroy them that Israel lives. We need to shout it to the anti-Semite movements that are growing on the college campuses of America and most Americans are totally asleep to it, that Israel lives. We need to shout it to the Second Vatican Council who said the Roman church has replaced Israel, that God is done with the Jew, that Israel lives. We need to shout it to the boycott, divest, and sanction movement that Israel lives. We need to shout it in the halls of Congress that Israel lives. We need to tell our Reformed brothers that Israel lives, and we need to shout it in this auditorium today, Israel lives. Israel lives. And God wanted to fix that thought forever in your mind. Here in verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Isn't that interesting? On the gates are the 12 sons, and now here on the 12 foundation stones are the 12 apostles. And it's reminding us that the promises that came through Israel were he put their names on the gate and were ultimately fulfilled through the ministry of the apostles, he will herald throughout all of eternity. Now some think, by the way, they, I know someone will ask me before I'm done, who's the 12th apostle since Judas died? And that's a good question. And let me just say, I can absolutely tell you with full, absolute authority that it's not me, okay? <laughs> well, who is it? Some would say, well, it must be the Apostle Paul. Well, it's not Paul. Others would say, well, it has to be Judas. I mean, Matthias, who replaced Judas. 
And others would say, we'll never know until we get to heaven. We do know. And God made it clear. Hold your finger here and turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 1. Acts are right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it covers, if you remember, the first 30 years of church history. The four Gospels really funnel into Acts chapter 1. And I say that because Matthew concludes with the resurrection. And the Gospel of Mark, if you remember, ends with the ascension. The Gospel of Luke, if you remember, ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the Gospel of John ends with the promise of the second coming. And interestingly, here in Acts chapter 1, all four records are brought together right here in the book of Acts. And it serves as a bridge between the Gospels and the epistles. Look at Acts chapter 1, and let's pick it up in verse uh, 15 here. We're told, at this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together. And he said, and please notice carefully verses 16 and 17. Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his portion in this ministry. Now we must ask, why did Jesus choose Judas? Knowing that Judas would reject him uh, and become a guide to those who arrested him. Well, because God is sovereign and Jesus is sovereign and this was part of God's sovereign will. Now, God did not give uh, Judas, uh, make him like a machine where he had no free will. The evil, wicked plan that he hatched was his own. Now remember, there's one thing that God cannot do, and that is God cannot learn. God knows everything. And so God can write centuries before it ever happened that one of the apostles of the Messiah would betray the Messiah. And Peter just told us that Judas did what he did. Why? Because the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David. You say, did he have a choice? Of course he did. Was Judas forced to betray Christ? Of course he was not. God gave him a choice, and God actually wanted Judas to be saved. But Judas chose not to be saved twice over in John's gospel. Jesus tells us that Judas did what he did because he was always an unbeliever. He was lost. He never received Jesus as the Lord. And Jesus loved him and could have forgiven him. But God prophesied that he would do this. He was not some puppet on a divine chessboard. He chose as an act of his own will to do what he did. Do you think God crippled him and then blamed him for limping? Of course not. He did what he did as an act of his own free will. Now, when you come to verses 18 and 19, it's clear that these two verses are not a part of Peter's sermon. They're parenthetical. You see the parentheses? Now, understand, obviously, there are no parentheses in the Greek New Testament. But as Luke writes what happened on this day, he wants to give a parenthetical note. And so the publishers are correct in putting this in a parenthesis. And by the way, I should say that what we're about to read is a favorite verse by liberal theologians who want to discount the truthfulness of the Bible along with Mormons. Let's look at it, verse 18. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. Now, this is totally consistent with what Matthew records. If Mormon missionaries show up at your door, and if they get far enough with you, where you're trying to convince them, hey, look, the Bible says this, the Book of Mormon says this, and they both can't be true. The Book of Mormon, for instance, says Jesus was born in Jerusalem, the Book of Alma. The Bible says he was born in Bethlehem. They both can't be right. So when push comes to shove, they'll say the Bible has been corrupted and every Mormon missionary has been trained with four different so-called contradictions that they can point out to you in the Bible. Here's one of them. They'll say, well, Matthew said he hung himself, but here in the book of Acts it says he fell headlong and he burst open and all his intestines gilled out, uh, fell out. Well, these two accounts don't contradict each other. They complement one another. 
In all probability, he hung himself over a cliff. And we know the approximate place because it's recorded in Scripture where he died. And there was a great cliff right along there. And in either case, after he died, the knot either slipped or the rope broke or the branch of the tree snapped. And he fell forward his bloated body and popped open. Luke is just giving us all the juicy details. That's all. They, They don't contradict. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem. So that in their own language, that field was called Helkidama, meaning an Aramaic field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate. Let no one dwell in it. And let another man take his office. Therefore, verse 21, it is necessary that the men of the men who had accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So Peter's proposal here sheds clear light as to who could potentially fill this 12th spot. We know it has to be a person who from the beginning, from the time of John's baptism, was involved in the ministry of Christ. And in that room of 120, it appears that there are two viable options. And so they need wisdom. Which of the two do they pick? Verse 22. So they put forward two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all men. Show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Now, please note, they prayed, and that was natural. They were already in a prayer meeting. And Jesus, of course, the night before he chose his 12, he had prayed And these 11 are following Christ's pattern. They're seeking wisdom. And they draw lots. Why lots? Because the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. And so sometimes in the Old Testament, there are different means for finding the will of God. Proverbs 16.33, put that in the margin there. The lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. And so casting lots is never done again after Pentecost. Why? Because now we have the Spirit of God to direct us. Not in the way Beth Moore and Stephen Furtick and some of these other crazies are saying, you know, God spoke to me and I got a direct revelation. You know, Beth Moore, I listen to her sometimes, it's like she's getting these text messages from heaven. What else did he say? Go out and make a snowman with me, Beth. And, you know, it's just crazy stuff. That's the kind of stuff cults do. But you see, the church is so ignorant and so biblically illiterate They buy into that foolishness, and we will see the warning in Scripture before we're done with this book of adding or subtracting to God's Word. Now, God may speak to you, but it will always be in conjunction with this book, and you cannot add or subtract to this book. It is a completed revelation, period. Now, he's given you the Holy Spirit, where sometimes you're not sure about a particular issue, Because God hasn't maybe given, should I go move to Atlanta or should I move to Chicago? And you move in one direction and there's kind of a check in your spirit. "Ah, This doesn't quite feel comfortable. Well, the scripture says in Colossians 3, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And the word rule there refers to an umpire, to a referee who makes a decision. And sometimes our umpire, God, the Holy Spirit, who will never add to his word, never subtract to his word, but he'll put just a little check in your spirit that maybe you shouldn't move in this direction. Well, here's an occasion. They're drawing lots. The lot falls to Matthias. So you want to know back here in Revelation who's on that 12th stone? It's this man named Matthias. The lot is cast into the lap, but every decision comes from the Lord. And why did they need a 12th apostle? We've already studied it. I'm almost done. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, we saw that's the Messiah's reign on the earth, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes. 
Somehow during the millennial reign of Messiah, these 12 men are going to have some special role in dealing with the Jewish people. Not to judge sin, that's a unique privilege given to God alone, but somehow they are going to rule and reign with Christ over the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel for their faithfulness. Now, I'm almost done. Go back to Revelation, verse 12. Here's this city, this eternal capital. It had a great and high wall, 12 gates. At the gates, 12 angels. The names were written on them, who of the 12 sons of the tribes of Israel. Verse 13, there were gates in the east, north, south, west. Verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on all those 12 stones were named the 12 apostles. Now, I spent a lot of time on that, but it's going to become critical to our next message in the Revelation. God is faithful. God keeps his word. He keeps every promise he has ever made. He's not done with Israel. He's loved them with an everlasting love. And as he used that nation to bring about the first coming, he will use that nation to culminate human history as you and I know it. And those 12 tribes and those 12 apostles will be memorialized on the gates and the foundation stones. And if you die of a heart attack before the day is over and you go to heaven, you will see their names written there. Now, this is a city that God wants you to go to. Do you have assurance that this is your home? You say, I hope so. I think so. Maybe so. You won't be able to scale the wall and just walk in. If your name is not recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, you'll never get in. And God wants you to go, but he has only one way to send you there, and it's through Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through him. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you that if someone will confess you, you will confess them. But your word is so clear, if they deny you, you will deny them. Thank you that when we receive the Lord Jesus, you receive us with open arms. Help someone today who's unsure to know that they can achieve nothing to change their status. You made it so clear that if one could be saved by human effort, then Christ died for no reason. Help someone today, as we just saw pictured in baptism, that the death, burial, and resurrection is what saves us. You said it's the gospel, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Help someone today, Father, to believe, to call upon Christ in faith. But for those of us who have done that, help us to have our eyes wide open. No one knows the day or the hour, but you told us what events would take place for the second coming. And we are witnessing these very things that you wrote of centuries ago, millennia ago. Help us not to be lethargic in the days that we live in, days like Noah and days like Lot, days of immorality and days of perversion. Help us not to be sucked up into this day of worldliness, but help us to be alert, watching, waiting for the return of your son. Help us to warn men and women and boys and girls this week of their need to come to Jesus, and we ask it in his name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing our hymn of invitation. And this is the time for you if you're here and you're a Christian and you've never made that public to leave your seat and come to this front row. If you're a believer and you need a church home, we want to give you that opportunity to leave your seat. We would ask you to join publicly. Maybe you've never been baptized as these four did today in these two services, but you know you need to be. I invite you as well. Matt's going to lead us. If you have a decision, you step out and you come right now and meet me here.